everyone, Alex Dunn here, and today we're going to do something a little bit different. If you have been wondering why everyone on social media, really specifically Twitter, has been talking about kidneys recently, whew, we're going to do a semi-deep dive, really a recap of the New York Times article that is going around entitled, Who is the Bad Art Friend? We're going to discuss who is the bad art friend and a little bit of writerly inspiration where we get our inspiration from for the things that we write and ethical and moral boundary lines. I actually think this really opens a huge can of worms that I wanna noodle on further and do a more in-depth video on. So this really is gonna be a little bit of a fun deep dive, got some screenshots. I'm gonna clear it up for you so that if you can't or won't use your one free read on the New York Times, I think you get like five a month now, on this article, you'll get the cliff notes here. I just had such a wild time reading this yesterday, and yes, I did use one of my free reads on this, and honestly, I do think it was worth it, because I was just seeing all these tweets about kidneys, and I wanted to know what the jokes were and what the meta was, so now you're going to know too. So what the heck is a bad art friend? Who is this about? Why are we talking about kidneys? So, a tale of two writers. And on the one hand, you have Don Dorland. Don altruistically donated her kidney many years ago, but at the time that a lot of this takes place, Don had donated her kidney pretty recently. What's notable is that Dawn didn't donate her kidney to a specific person, a loved one, or a friend. Dawn generally donated her kidney so that it would go to a worthy recipient. And Dawn penned a letter to this would-be recipient that would eventually be shared with that person. And just to share her journey, Dawn creates a private Facebook group and invites a bunch of her friends to it. You know that thing though? I think it's that thing where you were added to groups by someone you know. That's basically what it was. We've all been in that circle of hell. And Dawn posts things about her kidney donation journey on this Facebook group and specifically posts the letter that Dawn has written to this potential recipient. Enter Sonia Larson. At the time, Sonia Larson wasn't a published author, but now Sonia Larson is. This all was taking place in Boston. These people were all in a writer circle in Boston. Specifically, they volunteered at a place called Grub Street, which has workshops and whatnot. And Sonia specifically is also in a writer group called the Chunky Monkeys. And one famous author who was in that group is Celeste N, who actually was quoted in this article. There are so many good nuggets in this article, the drama the twists, the turns, the interesting portrait and meta angles that we're going to get to. Sonia is in this group that Dawn has added her to, and this is where I'm going to get into screenshots because this is all about direct quotes and also a great example of journalism because I was reading this, it starts off in Dawn's point of view presenting Dawn's kind of backstory and side of the story essentially, then it ping pongs over to Sonia. It is really presenting both sides, so to speak, with direct quotes from both of them as well as a ton of people involved in this. Like the sourcing on this, the people who agreed to speak on the record, I was honestly surprised. But it's written in such a way with some clever paragraphs and references. It's really about painting a portrait. I will read some of these and l let's see what emerges for you. This You're gonna see why everyone is losing their mind. But just after surgery, when she checked Facebook, Dorland noticed some people she'd invited into the group hadn't seemed to react to any of her posts. On July 20th, she wrote an email to one of them, a writer named Sonia Larson. Then we get a little bit of the backstory of Sonia and Dorland, and I already gave you some of these nuggets, but there is a writer group called the Chunky Monkey. And when I got to this quote, I screamed a little and was like, is this where this is going? One of those writing group members, Celeste Ng, who wrote Little Fires Everywhere, told me that she admires Larson's ability to create characters who have these big blind spots. While they think they're presenting themselves one way, they actually come across as something else entirely. So Dawn emails Sonia, basically like, trying to strike up a conversation and manages to work in, oh, did you see that I donated my kidney? And this is what comes back. 
Only then did Larson gush. Ah, oh, yes, I did see on Facebook that you donated your kidney. What a tremendous thing. Asterisk, can I just point out that throughout this, you can tell that these are adult literary writers because they, they, I'm way more casual than this in the email and the group chat. Tremendous, what a word. Afterward, Dorlin would wonder, if she really thought that it was great, why did she need reminding that it happened? A bit further down, they wouldn't cross paths again until the following spring, a brief hello at AWP, the annual writing conference where the subject of Dorland's kidney went unmentioned. A month later at Grub Street Muse Conference in Boston, Dorland sensed something had shifted. Not just with Larson, but with various Grub Street eminences, old friends and mentors of hers who also happened to be members of Larson's writing group, the Chunky Monkeys. Barely anyone brought up what she'd done, even though everyone must known she'd done it. It was a little bit like if you've been at a funeral and nobody wanted to talk about it. It was just strange to me, she said. I left that conference with this question. Do writers not care about my kidney donation? Which kind of confused me because I thought I was in a community of service-oriented people. Now you know why everyone on Twitter is saying, does no one care about my kidney donation? Or some variation on, on that meta joke direct quote. So that's basically like part one, act one of this, I guess we'll call it a drama. A tale of two writers. One altruistically donates her kidney, creates a private Facebook group, posts stuff to it, and is really gobsmacked when fellow writer friends don't congratulate her on it or pat her on the back for it or bring it up at all. But then the story turns. Act two of this story. So there's a bit more back and forth between Dorlin and Larson. All the quotes are in the New York Times article. I suggest you read them. Again, I didn't want to copy everything and go overboard, but the long story short is they have a little back and forth and that's that. But then someone tags Dawn in a Facebook comment. It is a Facebook comment saying like, Oh, I see that Sonia is writing a short story about kidney donation. Like, you must be the inspiration. That's so nice. And they tagged Sonia. And so Don waits. Don's like, first, of course, going like, is Sonia writing something about kidney donation? But then waits for Sonia to say something. And she doesn't. So Don messages her. And Sonia doesn't respond. She sends an, an escalating message. She messages her again. And it builds and there's no response. And then 10 days later, Larson wrote back saying, yes, she was working on a story about a woman who receives a kidney, partially inspired by how my imagination took off after learning of your tremendous donation. That word again. In her writing, she spun out a scenario based not on Dorland, she said, but on something else, themes that have always fascinated her. I hope it doesn't feel too weird for your gift to have inspired works of art, Larson wrote. Dorlin wrote back within hours. She admitted to being a little surprised, especially since we're friends and you hadn't mentioned it. The next day, Larson replied, her tone a bit removed, stressing that her story was not about you or your particular gift, but about narrative possibilities I began thinking about. There's a little bit more from there. Cooler and cooler messages. Larson leaning back, Dorlin leaning forward. We come to a time jump. Dorlin decides, I'm going to leave it. She sees that something is published by a small audiobook company that will narrate and publish short stories. She ignores it. She doesn't want to know what this inspiration ended up being from Sonia. She leaves it. But then Sonia's career starts to take off. There are lots of great little nuggets here. But in the interim, I want to share, because this is where the story ping pongs back to Dorland's point of view, I just want to share this nugget of a line. Dorland is not shy about explaining how her past has afforded her a degree of moral clarity that others might not come by so easily. So Sonia's career is taking off. She has a couple of short stories published in notable places, and this specific story starts building some steam. Specifically, it is selected at the Boston Book Festival for One City, One Story, and this is the point where Don decides to actually read it. And the article goes into detail for us of what the short story ended up being. So I will read you the relevant paragraph. 
Chun Tao, or a character with that name, turns up in many of Larson's stories, as sort of a motif, a little different each time Larson deploys her. She appears again in The Kindest, which is what the short story ended up being. The story that Larson had been reading from at the Trident bookstore in 2016, that is when the person on Facebook uh, tagged in Dawn saying, hey, didn't know you inspired a story. Here, Chun Tao is married with an alcohol problem. A car crash precipitates the need for a new organ, and her whole family is hoping the donation will serve as a wake-up call, a chance for Chun Tao to redeem herself. That's when the donor materializes. White, wealthy, and entitled. The woman who gave Chun Tao her kidney is not exactly an uncomplicated altruist. She is a stranger to her own impulses, unaware of what she considers a selfish act also contains elements of intense, unbridled narcissism. That's like the midpoint turn in this story. This is where, this is the first, the first time when, because you know, so many of us narrated the experience of reading this to our, our friends in our own group chats, which we're gonna come to that third act plot twist uh, of like, <gasps> the gasp of like, the shade. Also sounds like a great, great short story. But this is also where the plot gets complicated. You know those really great stories, those suspense stories with the midpoint turn? Because it's supposed to color everything in a new light. And this is where it colors everything in a new light. Because we have to start asking ourselves how we feel about the choices that Sonia has made in terms of inspiration. Who is the bad art friend? This is when it starts to snowball. Little, little snippet here. In early drafts of the story, the donor character's name was Don. I'm going to remind you that this is about Don Dorland, the character was named Don. In later drafts, Larson ended up changing the name to Rose. We're going to talk about versions of the draft of this short story. We, we are going to talk about that. But now back to the, 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 the growing escalation of what some of this back and forth is. Who is, who is the bad art friend? Dorland could keep the kindest out of her life for only so long. In August 2017, the print magazine American Short Fiction published the short story. She didn't buy a copy. Then in June 2018, she saw that the magazine dropped its paywall for the story. The promo and the opening essay on American Short Fiction's homepage had startled her. A photograph of Larson side by side with a shot of the short fiction titan Raymond Carver. I love the literary drama going on here. This is just, this is like MFA, like. WWE. The comparison does make a certain sense. In Carver's story, Cathedral, a blind man proves to have better powers of perception than a sighted one. In The Kindest, the white savior kidney donor turns out to need as much salvation as the Asian American woman she helped. Still, seeing Larson anointed this way was, to say the least, destabilizing. This whole story is about like jealousy and pettiness and interesting, interesting choices. We're, we're coming into our, th our, our break into three. <laughs> we're, we're all about the plot twists. So she reads this version of the story and there are things that are concerning to her that like th th there's a letter in the short story written from the donor to the intended recipient and it, it felt very spiritually similar to her, to her own letter, but it wasn't her letter, but regardless, she starts to feel very, very concerned. And this is when everything turns. She finally listens to that earlier published audiobook of the earlier draft of the short story. We're gonna talk about drafts. And when she listens to that audio recording, the letter, Dorland's letter. Personally, my childhood was marked by trauma and abuse. I didn't have the opportunity to form secure attachments with my family of origin. I'll read you the first line of the letter from the early audio published version. My own childhood was marked by trauma and abuse. I wasn't given an opportunity to form secure attachments with my family of origin. I won't read the whole thing, but as you can, they're, they're identical. They're basically identical identical minor word changes in, in the following sentences. The smoking gun of the early draft, making it just abundantly clear, 100%, Sonia Larson was inspired taking Don Dorland's story and her specifically her letter and used it to form this short story, to form the backbone of this short story, but specifically 
that the original text of the letter was in this earlier version of the short story. Now it's not in the version of the short story that's being published in the American Short Fiction Anthology or being highlighted by the festival. However, the letter still feels spiritually similar. Dawn did read that version when she saw the free preview of it. And so Dawn starts emailing everyone she can think of, contacting everyone she can think of at the anthology. She reaches out to the Boston Globe. She reaches out to the Boston Book Festival and basically says like, this woman is a plagiarist. How do you feel about someone plagiarizing? She emailed like schools that Sonia had gone to. Like she goes on the war path. She hires a lawyer and is basically saying to the festival like because the festival was going to distribute the short story for free to 30,000 people in Boston and she said I will sue you basically if you do this which meant finally Sonia has to start responding and defending herself. So this is the first time Sonia really kind of responds to this. Sonia writes to the Boston Globe and says Anyone who sympathized with Dorland's claims afforded Dorland a certain privilege. My piece is fiction, she wrote. It is not her story, and my letter is not her letter. And she shouldn't want it to be. She shouldn't want to be associated with my story's portrayal and critique of white savior dynamics. But her recent behavior, ironically, is exhibiting the very blindness I'm writing about, as she demands explicit identification in and credit for a writer of color's work. So this is really where the plot thickens. And she makes a good point in the sense of, yeah, you shouldn't really want to be identified as this character uh, because of what the short story is is displaying. But the, the, the plot thickens. We're, we're almost at act three now. I'm about to give you that plot twist. Um, it, this is very... Editing Alexa here. I realize I missed one screenshot quote that I definitely wanted to share. And it comes right here. And that is what happened with the book festival. So the book festival essentially canceled One City, One Story and said, we're not distributing the short story at all. We're just not gonna do this event this year. And frankly, we could sue you because there is a clause in the contract that was signed like saying, this is my own work. And this represented a huge setback, potential setback in Larson's career. And I'm sure she was really freaking out. Well, she has some of her friends like go to the book festival to try to defend her. And the response from the book festival, I just thought it's like another little like moment in this story when the Chunky Monkeys co-founder Jennifer DeLeon made a personal appeal invoking the white savior argument the response from Porter was like the slamming of a door. That story should have never been submitted to us in the first place Porter wrote. This is not about a white savior narrative. It is about us and our sponsor and our board not being sued if we distribute the story. You owe us an apology. Porter then emailed Larson too. It seems to me that we have grounds to sue you, she wrote to Larson. Kindly ask your friends not to write to us. Whew. This story, y'all. The early draft had the exact text of the letter. That's not great. And the article talks about another similar recent uh, example of real life inspiration, inspiring fiction and the potential blowback there. It mentions cat person, which is definitely something that I found really, really interesting and is what got me started really thinking about this. There have been some other examples as well that I'll discuss in more detail in a different video. Cat person was written by someone, this like viral article piece, and then it turned out we found out more recently, a woman wrote her own piece saying, I think I am the subject of cat person, that essentially the writer who wrote that was the ex-girlfriend of her ex-boyfriend and had basically fictionalized her real life and real aspects of her story and kind of what a violation that felt like, but it was heavily fictionalized. So the article says the kindest, however, contains something that cat person does not. An actual piece of text that even Larson says was inspired by Dorland's original letter. At some point, Larson must have realized that that was the story's great legal vulnerability. Did she ever consider pulling it out entirely? And then it talked to her and she said she did consider pulling it out, but the letter was like this really important part of the kind of story structure. And this is where we get to the to the great plot twist. The thing that had every writer girding their loins, clutching their chest, considering deleting their internet history. So this all turns into a lawsuit. <laughs> 
actually Sonia files first. Sonia files against Don for defamation and Don files a countersuit. This is still an active lawsuit, but this is where we get into discovery. The third act plot twist, which was, as part of the lawsuit, they subpoenaed the group chats. Everyone take a moment of silence for the authors in the group chat. Because no matter how you feel about the content or the morality of a salty group chat, they're supposed to be sacred. Uh, private author chat spaces, private chat spaces should be private, but they weren't in this case. I'm really curious. <sighs> Did the lawyers try to fight this? Anyway, they subpoenaed the group chats, and that's when the real tea spills in Act 3 of this article. There, in black and white, were pages and pages of printed texts and emails between Larson and her writer friends, gossiping about Dorland and deriding everything about her, not just her claim of being appropriated, but the way she talked publicly about her kidney donation. They got texts, too. Among her friends, Larson clearly explained the influence of D Dorland's letter. In January 2016, she texted two friends, I think I'm done with the kidney story, but I feel nervous about sending it out because literally it has sentences that I verbatim grabbed from Don's letter on Facebook. I've tried to change it, but I can't seem to. That letter is just too damn good. I'm not sure what to do, feeling morally compromised like a good artist but a shitty person who is the bad art friend. And on August 15th, 2016, a day before telling Dorland, I value our relationship, Larson wrote in a chat with Allison Murphy, dude, I could write pages and pages more about Don, or at least about this particular narcissistic dynamic, especially as it relates to race. That woman is a gold mine. Whew. That's the end of my screenshots, not the end of the article. The story is not done essentially because this lawsuit is still pending. That is the cliff notes, but seriously read the article. There's so much more. Who is the bad art friend? There's a ton more from Larson, again, why I do recommend you read it. And she basically says, cause this is where we get into the inspiration. What are the ethics and the morality of what inspires fiction? We're writers. We all pull from real life for our fiction. Where are the lines? Larson says this is art. This is, she, she was inspired by something real. Uh, and and it's, it's clear, <laughs> she, she won't admit it outright, but when you take the Celeste in quote and the description of the short story, plus that text message, RIP, <laughs> private chat and group messages and texts and private emails, this, um, it's very clear that, well, okay, so let's get into the meta of this. And again, why I do recommend reading this. This is some great journalism. I spent half of this article, it's a journey to go on, because I spent half of it going, wait, who is the hero of this piece? What is the lens for this piece? All journalism has lensing. All journalism has bias. You're always going to approach something from a point of view because you are choosing uh, the quotes that you insert and the best journalism is you use someone's own words to say what you will. And this piece does that a lot with Don Dorland, um, but there's still lensing choices. And the first half is all from Don's point of view. Uh, it says things very straight up, quite straightforward, very seriously, but it, when you contrast it <laughs> with things said about the short story, about Sonya, etc., The fascinating thing to me is Don Dorlin suggested this piece. She approached the journalist about writing about this, but she approached the, the New York Times, I suppose, because I think Don thought that this is gonna go another way. How has it gone? Who is the bad art friend? I think this is where I ended up very conflicted. <laughs> about this whole piece. I will say instinctively, and I feel like a lot of people are leaning this way, if you go off of kind of all the kidney jokes and the meta on Twitter, and like seriously the shock horror of the group chats being subpoenaed, honestly, I think people are allowed to say things privately among their friends. Uh, many of us have been inspired by people in our lives who are outrageous in some way, who have big personalities in some way, who sometimes in some cases demonstrate behaviors that indicate certain 
behaviors <laughs> and personality types and whatnot that are very fascinating to explore through fiction. I relate to that. And you know, if I had a person, a writer person in my circles doing what Dawn did, I probably also would have pulled that into, into fiction. I have pulled things into my fiction inspired by real people, by other writers. But this is where we get into, so if this were an am I the asshole post on Reddit, I thought about this, Fred and I talked about this, it would be ESH. This is an everyone sucks here situation for sure, for sure, where it's like Dawn is on another level, right? Sonia was inspired by something she saw to craft a story. Sonia unfortunately made some missteps, naming the character Dawn in the first draft, making the kind of transfer a little on the nose, and yet God, I kinda, I kinda wanna read her short story now. It sounds like a really interesting piece of short fiction, and I don't normally read short fiction. I'm interested in the themes that she explores through that short story. I'm interested I mean, honestly, the Celeste Ng quote made me interested in reading everything Sonia writes because I love stuff like that. And where it all really does kind of fall apart, like, I don't think it's fair to hold the group chats or the private chats or the private emails or the private text against Sonia. The lawsuit might, that there's speculation in the article that it actually might help her case. She's arguing that this is a transformative work, that she transformed the work of the original informational letter, which represents a genre, essentially. It's very common for donors to write letters to their recipient in this situation, because in the final published version, she did essentially write her own letter inspired by the original letter, but it is not the letter. And she might win that legal argument, in fact, because she it is on record through this horrifying subpoenaed private communication that she would that's what she did intentionally it's it, it could work in her favor that she did to basically admit that she was inspired by the by Dorland's letter specifically but it's just so messy and complicated that there was that early version the audio recorded version of the story that had the original letter verbatim that she didn't actually change it until Dorlin had contacted her and there are emails of her on record emailing someone who was publishing a version of it of why she needed to make edits to the letter and she specifically cited Dorlin who seemed a little bit obsessive which yes there's a whole thing about how she now like basically cyber stalks Sonia and is just really jealous of her career this whole thing is messy. So the good news is that the whole like lit fit community can no longer point their fingers at YA and say that all the drama's in YA. There's enough drama, love, and writer jealousy, pettiness to go around. So where does this leave us? As I said, I want to ruminate on all of this and put together more thoughts and have a discussion. And in fact, we can start that discussion in the comments down below. I am still really thinking about this and I've definitely thought about my own work and I think we're all now thinking about our own work. I think we're all now thinking about our own group chats of where's the line between inspiration and appropriation and stealing and plagiarism. And Dorlin is alleging suing over plagiarism, but it's not really plagiarism if you take the idea of a letter and you write your own. It's also not plagiarism to base something on another person. So this is honestly like really, really messy. I'm definitely interested to think about it a lot myself in including in terms of contrasting it to cat person. There's another story that came up in the last year or so that I can think of called Consensual Hex that I think definitely enters into the conversation. Well, because you get into the wibbly wobbly space of what is being inspired by a person for your fiction and what is maliciously <laughs> being inspired by someone for your fiction. Where's the line? Is it okay as long as they never find out? Is it just about changing enough details? It's this is gray, this is not black and white, and you know that YA and publishing and discourse online does not like nuanced topics. We like to have definitive answers on either side, and I'm I'm not sure I can give you one, but it's definitely made me think a lot. Uh, who is the bad art friend? I don't think they were ever friends. <laughs> and the article kind of goes into that too, that some of this awkwardness is, you know, 
the social politics of author communities and and circles and conflicting personalities and social mores and jealousy and pettiness and it's real interesting it's it's real interesting the irony being i was already working on an outline about making writer friends and writer friendships and that's coming because th this that is going to be the topic this <laughs> this month inspiration and writer friends who is the bad art friend everyone sucks here what a messy situation Whew. but i do um enjoy the delicious irony and i think this is mostly why this is going kind of viral and people are really enjoying it of Dawn really thought this article was going to go another way. Dawn sees herself as both the hero of the story as well as the victim. When, when words come out of Dawn's own mouth about kind of her kidney donation and this whole situation, when you ha have the outsider perspective and you're reading it and you're like, that's not normal. And I, and I think that's where it's interesting putting yourself in the shoes because you're like, I would probably also talk about it in the group chat and I might also be inspired for fiction and I think we all have to do our soul searching and ask ourselves that question in what ways have we been inspired by real life for our fiction what steps have we taken to mine that inspiration that is definitely an aspect of art let me know down below in the comments what you think did you read the article are you just like reacting to what I'm telling you about this whole situation would you also vote everyone sucks here if this were an am I the asshole post? How do you think this is gonna affect the writing community? I, my big takeaway honestly was, wow, if they subpoenaed the group chats, the texts and the emails, what was private communication between writers? The Brooke Sherman, Jenny Bent lawsuit, when that discovery is made public, it's gonna be very, very interesting. If you didn't know, it's been shockingly on the DL, but it's all literally public information. Brooke Sherman is suing Jenny Bent over commissions from the Bent agency when he used to work there. She says he isn't entitled to them anymore because of bad conduct. And he's saying, pay me. And there are all these documents that are public, but the judge ruled that discovery is gonna be private while it's going on. But these things always end up being public later. I, I can't imagine they're gonna seal it permanently which means a lot of private communication between authors and agents and possibly editors. All of this publishing stuff is going to be public because of a legal proceeding, just like all of this stuff was public because of this legal proceeding. This is just really, really interesting just in terms of like precedent for uh, creative communication, social media, uh, like kind of private chats and snarking and, and legal proceedings. So Give this video a thumbs up if you like it. The next time something like this happens and lands in the New York Times, I'm happy to do like an analysis of whatever is going on. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching and happy, happy writing. Don't steal things from people. Don't sue people. Don't brag about your kidney donation. Happy writing, safely. Watch your group chats.